I'm Timmy, and this is Abel, and this is Three Old Tech Dudes. I was going to say minus two tech dudes, but... That's true. <laughs> <laughs> This week we've got a guest. Uh, I have with me Matt Abel, someone I've known for far longer than he probably wishes he knew me. And some years ago, Abel had himself a, a business where he built electronics. He does many other things today, I think. I don't know. I'll let you speak, but mm. Mm, good enough. All right. <laughs> so um, I said one day, if I recall, I have an Atari, but the Atari's joystick controllers. The cables are very short. You have to sit right on it. And I'm 30-something and my back hurts, so I don't want to sit on the floor, okay? I say, can you build something to remote control this and maybe add the select and reset buttons? Anyone that's played an Atari, uh, it's it's a very involved console. Basically, you have to sit there with it nearly in your lap so <laughs> to operate the games. So I said, can you do this? And there was some pause circuit on the Internet that you can add to one of the processors. Uh, how did that work? Recall? Uh, there's a there's a pin on the processor for I can't remember it's called holder pause. Mm. It's documented in the original processing processor specs. Oh. Well, it's a it's an AND gate. Mm. The the pause circuit on the chip works by if you're on a certain point in the clock. I think you have to be on the peak or on the rise. The only time you can pause it and actually hold the state is if you engage the hold pin at the peak or at the fall, whichever it was. So essentially we put an AND gate in that monitors the state of the clock. Then if you engage the pause button on the remote, the AND gate will wait until the right position of the clock to make to okay. actually engage the hold because it was a little more complicated than just turning yeah, the Yeah, just on. flipping it. Something high, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, this remote control system works via infrared, right? Infrared. That's the between the unit and the. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I'll go ahead and do a demo of that off screen yeah. here a little bit. Maybe the camera crew can catch some of this too. I'm gonna take it a little off screen. Here we have the. Uh, 1982 game Alien, yes, based on the movie. So, I don't know if you can get that in the lights or not. This is the remote control unit. It has its own board. It has a reset and select and the pause feature. I'll demo the pause feature now. If you hit this, the screen will just go blank as it waits. On, on this case, this game. If you let go of it, it comes right back where it was. Something the Atari 2600 doesn't normally do. It will show garbage on occasion. But as soon as you let it back, it comes right back. So, I think this one is the select. On the control box, so you see the at the bottom of the game, the different game selections, one, two, three, and four. It's the same as if you hit the button on the console, because it's pretty much just wired to that, I believe. Um, <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we'll go ahead, and this is pretty flexible. I think I can just set it back here. We'll hit yeah. reset, start a game. So I'm some six feet away at most and tend to not get eaten by aliens and crap <laughs> <laughs> and the joystick's just hooked to this unit and it's sending the commands back to the atari on the infrared uh receiver which is a little unit laying on the great cable next to the console right now so kind of a prototype of sorts oh i suck at this you know hey <laughs> Well, it's got a gun, but it didn't work. So that's the basics of how that works. So and I should have demoed this. You hit pause in the middle of it, and it comes right back, you know, even in gameplay where it should be. You'll get weird sounds sometimes, just the way the TIA chip gets stopped, I think, that generates the audio video. So, so yeah. So that's the basics of the unit there. Of course, it has a power switch. Um, 
slide back in here. So what drives these circuits? So it's got a microprocessor, right? Yep. So the, we'll call this the receiver, of course, that's wired in here. Yep. So this entire system is driven by a pair of microchip PIC processors, which microchip's been making microprocessors for many years. Mm. Um, these are very, very capable processors. They come in a wide line. These particular, this particular pair we're using are clocked at about four megahertz. <laughs> Faster than the, the game console itself. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, this is the, we're using PIC 16F628 chips, which have two kilowords of memory, which gives you about 4,000 instructions hmm. that you can store in 8-bit assembly. So of course, these are written in assembly. Um, the microchip PIC processors in this particular variety has 16 input-output lines where you can program each pin to do several different functions. So what we did in this system, Atari joysticks use literally just input-output lines. That's just a digital input. If you press up, it just turns an up signal on. Hmm. It's not analog. There's nothing, nothing fancy about how it works. Box of switches. It's just yeah. switches, yeah. <laughs> so what we did, or what I did on the, the transmitter, is we essentially just wired five pins from each joystick in, added the three control signals for pause, reset, and uh, select. Mm -hmm. And then we just read on each, as fast as we can, we read two bytes of data off of the pick, which is the state of all those inputs. Okay. And then we transmit that as fast as we can over wire, over infrared. Yeah. The receiver decodes it, puts it back on the outputs. <laughs> so it's a simple, there. it's a simple system because you're just monitoring inputs and outputs. Right. And you send two bytes of data, and we're sending at 40 kilohertz frequency on the inter, on the infrared oh, wow. side. Okay. So you get many, many, many updates per second. F far more than even probably you could even oh, yeah. slow that down and get away with it. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, and there's a pick in both units, so. Yeah. So. Yeah. There's a receiver program and a transmitter program, yep. and that's kind of the heart of this is being able to write assembly for the pick, which mm. you had learned to do and, and accomplished, and was able to yep. make this possible. So it's yep. basic, true electronic logic, which is fascinating. So. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It's it's an interesting. I don't know. Eight bit assembly is a a beautiful thing. <laughs> Most people probably would never say that, but. Yeah, something yeah, I'd like so. to learn, but I've never taken these, the time to get my head around yeah. it. <laughs> it's it's helped that these are RISC processors, so these are re reduced instruction set mm. chips. I think there's I think there's 28 instructions for these chips. Mm -hmm. um, it's not very many, yeah. and so it's it's very easy, but very quick to pick up and learn. Right, because it lowers the complexity of the assembly, yeah. so less you have yeah. to remember. You know? Yeah, it makes it a little slower, like doing an doing essentially an if, just a conditional branch mm -hmm. is six or seven lines of code in assembly. Mm -hmm. But they're a, they're a nice, simple simple chip to work with. Okay, yeah. Awesome. And the, other, and the best thing is the cost. These things cost around a dollar forty six per chip. Okay. Yeah. Fifty. So bottom, bottom price. Yeah. You know, everybody's, well, why wouldn't you use an Arduino? It's like, well, Arduinos are expensive. So. <laughs> yeah, and they're <laughs> They're for hobbyists. Yeah. I see that a lot, but I actually yeah. am more fascinated by this because obviously you have to know what every piece of that circuit does to design it or mm -hmm. what you need to put it together, really, as much as anything. And, uh, yeah. um, the good thing about using microprocessors is you you eliminate a lot of the dependence on external electron electronics. Sure. Because the processing code gives you a lot of flexibility over <laughs> over what you can do with those input and output lines. <laughs> right. Yeah. And the amount of extra hardware that's included in each one of these PIC processors is, you know, you have RS-232 input and output built into them. There's yeah. uh, some of the larger models have USB oh built wow. into them. Um, there's analog inputs, and analog, um, there's a, an analog to digital, or a digital to analog converter in it. So there's a lot of, a lot of features. Sure. So it looks like you just cat 5e e cables for the interface for this it's a good way to to i do that a lot use, i did use yeah. that kind of wire for that sort yeah. of thing and pieces of yeah this is an old speaker wire yeah <laughs> from a know, pc yeah. case probably and this is a two cd two cd rom audio cables oh, okay. together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Atari's use because yeah. the Atari's now, got the convenient portability so, to use the yeah. nine pin serial type DB9. Yeah. One of the one of the things to mention about this is this is using infrared and infrared tends to get a bad rep mm -hmm. on a lot of these just in general. Yeah. A lot of people say, well, that's awful. It's an awful design. Uh, infrared is only as good as the receivers and the, tr and the emitters that you use. Mm. Um, this, these emitters, which is actually a pair of them mm -hmm. on the front, sure. but these things have uh, something like a 50 foot range yeah. in their very wide angle. I mean, you know, I've tested this thing from 40 feet with, without even aiming. You just stick it somewhere, and yeah. it, it, it bounces enough in the room to work. Yeah. That's the emitter, and that's the yeah. receiver but, the deal. So, yeah. but most of these odd, most of these components, the switches, the infrared emitters, and receivers, most mm -hmm. of this stuff is just off-the-shelf stuff from Radio Shack. Uh, back sure. When we had Radio Shack, yeah. which is kind of the sad thing is. When you need something like this on short notice, because I think yeah. we, I think you suggested building this on like a Friday, something like like sometime that. on a Friday morning. We used to work together and, and we I, got to talking about it, yeah. And <laughs> I, uh, I ran and grabbed the parts Friday evening and built it over the weekend. Yeah. But yeah, and so I was floored. He's like, "Come try this out." I'm like, "Are you kidding me?" And it yeah. was pretty much in a working state by that point. Yeah. I, have, I have one I uploaded um, to YouTube on an old channel yeah. years ago of a demo, yeah. and like and people you, are like, "Why'd you use infrared on the you, comments?" And right, like, yeah. Yeah. It's fine. That was the biggest complaint. Can't be very far. Yeah. I'm like, this yeah. thing like worked across a house. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had a oscilloscope hooked up to the output coming out of the receiver on this end. Oh, sweet. As far as what was actually being decoded by the infrared. Right. But we're actually wasting a little bit of time with each one of these cycles because uh -huh. we're, you know, we're we're only using 11 bits of data, but we're actually transmitting two full bytes. Sure. Because it's simpler. Because right. it's an 8-bit processor. It's sure. just a lot easier. It's a neat system, and I have used it quite a bit. I haven't used it in a while because, frankly, I don't have time to play games like I used to. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but I I've, have a vast Atari collection. I've not, we've never shown it on 30TD yet, but that day's coming. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is a small, but a small piece of it, and uh, probably the most unique piece, partly because a friend built it and it works, and oh. <laughs> I assume we can keep it working if things die. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and one of the one of the other unique aspects of this that I don't even know if you're aware of okay. is that this was actually one of the last sets of circuits that I milled on my own CNC machine. Yes. <laughs> which is why these uh, circuits are kind of messy is because I was working within the parameters of a... Uh, yeah. Kind of show what that yeah. looks like, yeah. So later on you used, like, I remember you used some sort of chemical deal, didn't you? Or was that this process? Yeah. I, yeah. I went in to switch to chemical etching just because yeah. it's cleaner. Before you were yeah. done with your... And then the electronic area of your company, you were sending them overseas with plans, weren't you? And they were sending oh, yeah. nice boards yeah. back, really nice yeah. boards. I, I do have a photo of one of those wood insert here. Well. That's actually a cool idea, too. Because yeah, it kind of shows where the evolution of these boards went. Absolutely, yeah. Because this, this is earlier on stuff here this, like, for what you were doing. Yeah. So. This was essentially a prototype in every sense of the word. <laughs> uh, the intention was if we were ever going to make more of these, we would have sent these out to a board house mm -hmm. and had nice clean double-sided boards printed yeah. and, and the size of these would have went down considerably oh, sure. yeah. so these are uh, these are single-sided boards with uh, if anybody's ever tried milling a uh, circuit board with a mill <laughs> you'll understand the tolerances suck <laughs> you, you've got to give a lot of extra room for everything so, so yeah uh, when I was a kid I, I got an Atari when I was about 10, I was thought, man, it'd be cool if you could make games or pack this thing. And, you know, I tell that to my buddy Abel here, and he pretty much uber hacked the thing so, <laughs> in some ways. Well, so the machine itself, but he built a additional circuitry to enable a different way to do wireless. And there were like a RF wireless joysticks that Atari themselves sold around 1983, and I used to have a set of those till they failed, and they, they have a base <laughs> that tall, which is pretty comical. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> big a, rubber antennas on them. Let's use uh, uh, D batteries in those, right? I think so, yeah. It yeah. was or C's yeah. or something. Yeah, C's or D's. They did not last yeah. long. Uh, interestingly, he has this attached with the Atari. Uh, it's actually, this this board is powered off of the Atari's power supply and then passes the 9 volts onto the machine, which is also how it, Atari's RF sticks worked. <laughs> and they actually had a unit with two, basically, rabbit ear antennas or maybe one, I can't remember. And... Uh, 
it also was powered by the console power supply and then had a pigtail to power the machine. So, yeah. Neat stuff. Yeah. Anything else we know about it? I can't remember. I think that may be about it, huh? <laughs> 16D batteries. 16D batteries, yeah. 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 This one runs on a 9 volt, the transmitter does. So, yeah. yeah. 9 With, volt battery. Uh, so. We'll call it dubious battery life. Dubious battery life, yeah. yeah. Like I said, it was a prototype. Built it yeah. a weekend. Go try this. And I was like, ooh, this is cool. <laughs> that circuit board in there is about that much of that case. Okay. Yeah. And it needs at least 5 volts. So, the, is that a radio too hard project to, case, too? I think it is. Uh, the switches were, I think. Definitely. I probably, I, I think that is, <laughs> I think that is a Radio Shack case. Yeah. <laughs> I know the switches definitely are. Radio Shack, a lot, I mean, they sold a lot of stuff like we've talked about in past 3 OT yeah. videos, but they had a big advantage that you could, if you do electronics in any way and wanted to build something, you could pretty much go over there. It usually costs you a little more than ordering online or something, but, or even a catalog, a paper catalog <laughs> yeah. today, but you, you could get all the stuff right out of your hometown to do that, usually. So. Yeah. Yeah. Usually they'd at least have something close enough to make it work. It may right. not be what's exactly what you wanted, but now we're just screwed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Internet. Thanks, yeah. Obama. Wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> no, I was going to say thanks uh, Thanks to Radio Shack deciding they were a cell phone company. Yeah. Jeez. I'll never forget going in there and waiting over an hour to buy a clock battery for something for work one day because they were... They had one cashier, and she was trying to sell two people cell phones. And, but I had to have the friggin' battery, so mm -hmm. I yeah. it, <laughs> won't go there. Too late now. Now well, I'm already angry, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here here in our uh, town we live in, I was driving uh, by where the Radio Shack used to be, and I was kind of amused to notice that on the sign out front by the road, uh, the Radio Shack sign is still on the shopping center sign. Nope. The Radio Shack has been closed for probably two years at least. At least. <laughs> Still might think there's one there. It's not. So. <laughs> well, I guess that's all we have to say about this. Thanks for coming on 3OTD today. Yeah, well, thanks for having yeah. me. You're uh, one of our first guest uh, guest interviewees. We've we've interviewed a couple of people at our ham fest, but never at a regular shoot. So here you go. Yeah. The great sage and eminent Abel, well, which we've comically referred to him in the past. It feels weird being someplace where I can be seen. I don't like it. Yeah. Like many of us tech guys, he, he likes to uh, do his own thing at his own place and be left alone. So mm. I'm especially glad he chose to come be with us. So. <laughs> dark corners. Dark corners. Dark. And dark holes. So next time, I'm Timmy, and Nathan and Justin are here, but they chose to be crew today. Yay, crew. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> this is Three Old Tech Dudes.